Hello, and welcome to Detection as Code, Detection Development using CICD. If you're joining us live, our speakers are in the Slido chat area right now answering your questions. For audio and video issues, please click the technical support button below. I'd now like to turn it over to Patrick Garais and Jose Hernandez for the presentation. Hello, welcome everyone. So the threat landscape is, for us defenders is getting worse. It's ever changing. And, and really, this is one of our challenges, right? We really, really need to start keeping up. And, and one of the ways that uh, Patrick and I have thought of keeping up with this threat landscape is essentially through continuously testing and improving detections. And, and that's one of the challenges that, again, for us today, and specifically, what I mean by that is take data during the approach, uh, capabilities defenders, make sure that those detections that were working 90 days ago still work today, that the C2 callback didn't change. And if it did, make sure that you can catch it. If attackers are continuously improving their tooling, we should be doing the same thing. And if we do this, we should be also, as a, as a result, shortening, shortening the development life cycle of new detections. So when a new attack comes out, we should be ready to have a new detection to find it as soon as possible. Speed is the key to success as a defender. And fortunately, it's it's not we're not in an ideal scenario uh, today's day and age. What do I mean by testing detections? Uh, what do we mean by this? Specifically, think of the CICD workflow as software development or the typical software developer runs through in a software development lifecycle. You first commit code or you commit a change. That commit triggers some sort of build process that runs through uh, uh, continuously develop, uh, continuous integration pipeline that builds whatever code or whatever app you're building and then notifies you, notifies you whether the build was successful and a bunch of tests run to make sure that that build actually is ready for production. When the tests run successfully, you'll get notification of whether they were unsuccessfully or not. And ultimately, you end up deploying that software to production. Well, if we take this kind of mindset or this concept and we apply it to detection engineering, we can layer it and almost do exactly the same thing, right? You commit a detection, we convert, or you can convert those detections to whatever SIM or system you're going to deploy them to. Uh, most users today have more than one piece of software that deploy into in the large environment, which means you're going to have to package it and instead of convert it for that environment. But more importantly, you need to be notified of whether this build for this environment was successful or not. And then finally, have a way to test this replicably and take, like I mentioned earlier, a data-driven approach to the detection that's going out to production. If this detection is tested successfully, then deploying it to, then the next logical step would be like, let's get this detection out to production to find bad things. Now, let's dig into specifically what commit detection looks like or committing a detection looks like. I want to start with two examples uh, from two different projects here. One is called Sigma. The other one is called uh, Splunk Security Content. And both have different, slightly different ways that they approach writing detections. But a big, big commonality between both is they both projects adhere to a schema. Sigma and Splunk Security content both have over 200 essentially detections uh, uh, for SIMs that any individual consumer can leverage, and both are open source, so they're free. And the key of, of what, what makes this, uh, these, both of these projects successful is, again, this detection schema behind it. And what, why does a schema make this project successful? Specifically because applying a schema to detection development and not just again, writing a search for Splunk or writing some query for Elk, is that a schema is a lot easier to read, maintain, and essentially becomes product agnostic, right? And very, very, very much in vain. And, and the other beautiful part of leveraging a schema for, for detection development is there are various ways to enforce using a schema, whether it's written correctly or not, which makes testing and implementation a lot easier when it comes to deploying a search in a production environment. Now, one thing I, I want to highlight is both of these projects center around writing rules. And, and, and what I mean by that is 
there's a lot of products uh, out there today that really leverage and 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 rely upon a machine learning for and for anomaly detection. And they are they basically are anomaly detection engines, which are great at finding things that you may not know about. But they also tend to generate a lot of noise, especially when they're not properly trained or tuned. Where Sigma and Splunk Security Content, again, are focused on providing essentially rules that are targeted for known bad things, which ultimately end up being rules that get fed to train a lot of this ML machine learning based products that depend on essentially rules to then make anomaly decision, for lack of a better word. So, what I'm getting at is don't discount rules. Uh, they're still extremely valuable, and a lot of the new products end up relying on it. Now, if we're thinking about a detection development workflow similar to a software development workflow, you if, if you are leveraging a code repository, you're capable of then versioning, not only versioning, but also having a development lifecycle where you can branch off your detections of multiple teams of developers in parallel working across the same code base by being able to branch and merge back into the main code line for your detections. What does this mean? If you, you can have a SOC or a large team work on the same pool of detections without affecting each other while testing is still happening and sanity still uh, is kept across the team. Finally, if you're using a branching workflow and a, uh, essentially a modern code version system, you should be able to tag once you're happy with all the changes in a certain environment, a release and cut releases off for the rest of your consumers or your clients, e.g. any other business units that may leverage your detections. Now let's move on to the second phase of essentially detection engineering or using this uh, CICD workflow, which is converting detections and packaging them. And why, why are these two phases important? Well, I mentioned earlier, again, Splunk Security Continent and also Sigma both leverage uh, schema formats, so predefined schemas, to basically structure what a detection looks like with a bunch of metadata around it. Now, when it comes to having the rubber hit the road, these detection schemas need to be credited to a SIM or specifically a SIM-specific search or format and need to be configured for that SIM so you can actually execute it there. Both projects take a slightly different approach, uh, but ultimately the goal is to take this, this YAML that you see here and which has a bunch of context around it like how to implement and descriptions and essentially what MITRE IDs this detection is supposed to target and simply output what your SIM is going to use. In this case, for Splunk, it's just a Splunk search. And make sure that this Splunk search can be deployed in an environment and scheduled. For us, and specifically for security, uh, Splunk security content, this looks like a safesearch.conf configuration. If you can look at this example, there's things like uh, a cron scheduler for how often you want this detection to run. There are parameters around notable and what alerts do you want out of this detection, if it ever matches, so on and so forth. Each sim is going to be slightly different or totally different. And that's the beauty of having a, an agnostic, a product agnostic schema that you can leverage to generate detections for. The next step, uh, next major step uh, after this is notifying the build outcome. And here, I'm going to pass it on to Patrick to finish off what the CICD workflow would look like for detection engineering. Thank you very much, Jose. When we build the whole project, we can then validate different steps. For example, we saw like how to package detections, how to convert the detections. And then we can, in our CI CD pipeline, we can run different scripts, which then validates the content, for example, did I use the right key value pairs for the different key value for the different fields? Did, is it a, a compatible package uh, to, to your SIEM, to your L, to your Splunk, to your Azure? And uh, can our build process completely build a package? For example, here you can see CircleCI, 
Circle CI is a CI CD tool, which you can easily integrate together, for example, with GitHub. And we saw here in our validation phase, it called validate and build, that we first validate our content. Are all the fields, um, did the detection developer add all the correct fields into the key value, in, into the YAML file, which uh, Jose showed to us? Are we able then to take all the detections and build our build then for us uh, the Splunk detections? Are we able to package them all together into a package? And then uh, there is a the last command is called in this in this example it's App Inspect. This is something Splunk specific where it's a small tool which checks if that output the app is a valid Splunk app. But you can also replace that uh, with other um, with another job which uh, checks it for on the right app in Azure or in Elk. So I will try now because this is like in the middle. I try to now recap what we learn, what we had before, and then I will continue with test detections. First, we learned about commit detections. Uh, in commit detections, we we saw that um, how we can to, to use tools such as GitLab or GitHub to manage and versionize our detections. We, we learned that a detection schema is very important in order to manage the rules with all its advantages because a detection schema has provides you some abstractions from a specific configuration file for a specific scene. And that's why it's a lot better for a detection engineer uh, working with a detection schema instead of a product-specific configuration file. Then we saw how we can take that schemas and the detections in the detection specific format and convert them and package them into an app, which we can then use in our scene with all that detection rules in there. And then we saw that based on that generated package, we run different uh, validation scripts and in order to check if the output was really correct and if the if the output was uh, successfully generated by uh, by that step. Um, now let's come to test detections. It's very important that the security teams can rely on their detection rules. If they can't re rely on their detection rules, they never know if they miss something which means when they're deployed like 50 detection rules, they want to rely, they want to be able to rely on them. They are currently working. In order to do that, we need continuously testing of detection rules. Why I say continuously? Because there is so many moving pieces. Um, there can be changes in the operating system, changing in the parsing phase, changing in the seam itself when there was an update, which means we have to continuously test it. Not only one time during the development, we have to regularly test all the detections which are in production. Test detection, first of all, there's a lot of discussions about where to test detections. Few people say in a production environment, other people say in a detection lab environment. In my opinion, for developing and testing detections for the detection engineering team, I recommend to use a detection lab environment because the detection engineers want to have full control over the systems and therefore be able to attack the system and compromise the system, or even change some parameters which would be not allowed in a production environment. I don't know how many of you were allowed to run Mimikatz, for example, on the production domain controller. Probably nobody. In order to test our detections, we have to perform multiple steps. The first step is we need to build a lab environment. We have to build a lab in my environment which is as close as possible to our production environment, which means 
we need to have the same locking configurations. We have to have the same hardening configurations. We want to install the same tools as our production, uh, uh, the same tools which are also installed in our production environment. Then we want to be able to simulate attacks against the environment. There is already a bunch of um, awesome open source tools which you can use for them. Uh, I will shortly explain them later, but as um, two, two tools I want to specially highlight as adversary simulation tools are Atomic Red Team, developed from the from the Mitre guys, and uh, sorry from Caldera, developed from the Mitre guys, and Atomic Red Team. These tools can be used to perform attacks against this lab environment. For example, I have now spin up my lab and domain controller. And now I want to run a credential dumping attack against this uh, domain controller. This is normally things which I can't do in a production environment. That's why I suggest to use a detection lab environment. Then in the next step, we have a look into the generated logs which came out of this attack. In this logs, we can either use to develop new detections or test our existing detections for example, for, for a credential dumping attack. And then last but not least, because we are talking about a CI CD pipeline, we want to get out a report similar what you see before, what kind of detections were successful tested and what kind of detection failed the test. In the next slide, I want to now give you two projects for the for which focus on building up a detection lab, which you can use for detection development and detection testing. The first project which I want to highlight is Model Labs. Model Labs was developed by Roberto Rodriguez, and Model Labs is a repository of different cloud templates, configurations, and scripts to deploy a detection lab environment. The goal of Model Labs is to attack this environment with simulated adversaries and then recall these data sets and publish it in another project by Roberto Rodriguez called Modo. Modo is a project containing pre-recorded security events, which we all can then consume and use to develop and test our detections or to prepare a POC or POV, um, whatever you want. Model Labs is using the Azure Resource Manager templates to, to build a detection lab in Azure. And these templates are used to build the different virtual networks to the different Windows endpoints and also con configure the different machines and configure the logging. As I talked about logging, The, the telemetry data from the Windows endpoints are collected over a Windows event forwarder in Model Labs. The Windows event forwarder forwards the Windows logs, the, the Sysmon logs, and the PowerShell logs over to a Windows event collector. On the Windows event collector, NX log is installed and forward these logs as JSON logs to Logstash in JSON format. From there, you can do whatever you want. In this case, a Roboto is using that in an Azure Event Hub and then using a Kafka cat to, to store that data in his model projects. And you can easily go to his GitHub site, uh, just Google for model and GitHub, and there you can find a pre-recorded data sets which you can then download and use for development and testing of detection rules. The second project which I want to show you today is Attack Range. The Attack Range solves three main challenges in detection engineering. First of all, it build up, builds up a detection lab environment. It performs attack simulation with adversary simulation, such, such as which I talked about Atomic Red Team and Caldera. 
and it can easily integrate it into a CI CD pipeline. The attack range consists of different virtual machines such as domain control, Windows Server, Windows Client, a Splunk machine, and further, further instances such as a Kali Linux or a Splunk Phantom. The Linux and Mac endpoints are currently under development and uh, they will have OS query for, for logging purposes. The different virtual machines comes pre-configured, which means you will already get logs such as Windows event logs, Sysmon logs, PowerShell logs already in your Splunk in instance in the different indexes. And the Splunk instance is already completely configured. Furthermore, the different adversary simulation software is already pre-installed on the different Windows endpoints and Caldera is installed on the same box as Splunk. You can build the attack range in two different ways. You can either build it locally on your local laptop with Raygrant, or you can build it with Terraform in AWS. In both cases, we are using Ansible to configure all the different boxes, which means like it, it installs Splunk, it configures Splunk, or it also prepares the Windows machine to, to enable to install Sysmon or install a specific version of a specific Sysmon configuration. The build process takes around maximum 30 minutes depending on your uh, internet connection. And then you have the whole lab, um, which you can see in here. You can enable different boxes disabled according to your needs. The attack range supports different commands. The first command is everything which we learned around build. We, we heard that build is a very important goal from a detection lab. We support build, destroy, stop, and resume. I think all the different commands are self-explaining. I just want to give us a little bit more detail into stop and resume. There is some cases where we don't want to always build and destroy the lab. And as we also have the option to, to deploy it into AWS, we also sometimes want to shut down the EC2 machines in order to save money. That's why we also have the possibilities to stop the lab and resume it in that state as it was before. Then we have simulate attacks. We support Atomic Red Team and Caldera to simulate attacks. In this case, from our command line interface, we support Atomic Red Team in order to simulate any attack which you want. You specify the box which you want to target. We, we saw different boxes. For example, you either specify the Windows Server and Windows Client on Windows Domain Controller, and you specify which kind of MITRE attack you want to execute against this environment. For example, if, if you want to run a credential dumping attack, you would specify the MITRE attack ID, which is T1003 for credential dumping, and a credential dumping attack would be executed against that environment with one line of code. And then we have test detections. We now we simulate the attack, we, the logs were generated, and we want to use these logs in order to verify if our detection is working. That's why we have a search command where you can run, where we can execute your detection, and you get immediately back result if that detection was able to, to detect the attack or not. This is very important for detection development. So we, were, we're in, we, we talked about test detections. Now I want to talk about the test outcome. An integration of a detection lab into a CI CD pipeline will lead to multiple steps which need to be executed per detection test. First of all, First of all, we want to have to build a detection lab. We have to simulate the attack. We have to run the detection, destroy the detection lab, and then we loop to the next detection and start from the beginning. 
And this needs to be done in, I recommend it as a nightly job, which goes then over all detections which you have in your repository and that you're then able to test that different detections. In this case, you see an example with that tech range. We use the um, simulate uh, simulation of credential dumping attack, which you see on the left side with that command line attack range, Terraform simulate T1003. And then we wait, we wait a couple of minutes in order to ensure the logs are in in our logging, uh, in our seam. And then we run the, a specific detection which we want to test. In this case, it's attempted credential dumping from a registry via Reacted.exe. Reacted.exe can be easily used to dump uh, different hives in Windows. And this is a detection which exactly detects this specific uh, attack. And then, of course, we want to know if that attack was successful or not, which means you either have then a green check mark or red X if that was successful. Then let's come to the last step, the last step of that CI CD workflow, which is deploy detections. Detections can be deployed in three different ways. The first way is you can package detection into an app. Many scene vendors are using that concept of apps to add more features into their tool. They, they, these apps normally consist of multiple configuration files which add additional features or add the detections. CI CD can be used to already package this kind of app which then the SOC team easily can use and, de and deploy it into their scene. This is the first way. Then the second way is forking the project, the, the Git project, which means it's similar to the first step, but a user can first, before he build that app, he can change, he can, he can adapt the detections according to his environment, which means he can tune it, he can change it how he needs it. And the third way is a more cloud and microservice oriented way of deploying detections. With every release, we can update the REST API and users can, can directly hit that REST API for the latest detections. This is a very short development life cycle and we can also enrich it with contextual information, which means they can hit the API and get give me all the detections for APD28, for example, which means you can already enrich our detections with some metadata, which then can be used by the users. So let me shortly repeat what we learned in that talk today. We learned how to establish a continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline for detection rules to be able to quickly respond to new threats. Next week, you should download either TechRange or Model Labs, depending on what SIEM technology you're using, and try to install it and play around with that tools. In the next three months after this presentation, you should establish a CI CD workflow for sorry, a CI CD workflow for your SIEM detections and start to continuously test the detections. It's very important to do this step continuously. Within the next six months, you should think about sharing these detections with the InfoSec community. I, Jose and me are very, we are very happy to collaborate with the open source community and share our detections because I think when we share them, that helps everybody. And additionally, you should think about to make that process a little bit or a little bit more automated because you see you will when you start to do it manually you will lose a lot of time and then you can think about automate that with an ci cd workflow thank you very much for your attention we are looking forward to your questions in slido thank you